Hey everyone, welcome back to another Ask GN. As always, leave your questions in the comment section below for next week. I think we're going to do one main one for this week and then the Patreon Ask GN question, which you can get at patreon.com slash gamersnexus. So we'll probably do another one, but we're going to Taiwan in a couple of days here. So just for time's sake, probably limited to one. I'm going to talk more about that Computex trip momentarily. So a uh, lot of good questions for this week. One of them I'm going to address on the IC Graphite thermal pads. A lot of you are really interested. I do not blame you at all. I'm interested too, but we'll get to that in a moment. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzlies High-End Thermal Paste and Liquid Metal. Thermal Grizzlies Cryonaut is an affordable, high-quality thermal compound that doesn't face some of the aging limitations of other pastes on the market. Cryonaut has a thermal conductivity of 12.5 watts per meter kelvin, focuses on endurance, is easy to spread, and isn't electrically conductive, making it safe to use on GPU dies. Thermal Grizzly also makes Conductonaut Liquid Metal, which we've used to drop 20 degrees off some temperatures in our delitted tests. Buy a tube at the link in the description below. Okay, so first of all, the Computex stuff. If you're not familiar with it, if you're new to the industry or to this channel, we go to Taipei, Taiwan every year for a show called Computex. This is going on our third year now. And it's like CES, except bigger and more relevant. So Computex is gigantic. It's uh, over 200,000 attendees, I think. It's probably approaching 300,000, depends on how you count it. We're gonna be talking to most of the hardware companies in the industry. Some of it's scheduled, some of it's not, because they're just all over a four-story convention center. You can, it's kind of like memory manufacturers all next to each other, case manufacturers next to each other for the most part. So we can just kind of hit each booth and see what's up. Uh, some of them we do schedule. They tend to be in hotel suites if they're American companies. A lot of them prefer that route, uh, probably for cost-saving reasons. So anyway, we're going to be there. The show starts June 5th. We're going to start coverage on, I think, the 3rd or the 4th, pretty early. Uh, we have one factory tour scheduled. We have a ton of interviews scheduled and meetings about new products. And basically, you should subscribe if you're not, so you can catch all that stuff. Uh, should be a lot of fun, though. If you have really specific requests, here's what I'd like you to do. Uh, so as the show's going on, if you see some news of some product that you're interested in that we haven't covered and you think that we can provide a unique perspective, then please tweet at me. That's the best way to reach us during the show. It's at GamersNexus. Let us know who the vendor is and what the product is. We'll see if we can go check it out uh, if time allows. And that's probably the best way to get us out there. We, we try to be a try to keep the technical approach at these trade shows. So I do tend to have more uh, specification information I'm asking for at the booths than I think a lot of channels do and also not afraid to say something that, to say that something sucks at a booth. Uh, anyway, let's get into the questions. So first one here is from, uh, oh, also one more thing. We're gonna be in Japan briefly after Taipei. Just basically we decided to stop there on the way back because uh, it's kind of on the way. So uh, it should be pretty fun. We're going to go to Akihabara, I think, and see if we can do a video there. But anyway, if you have ideas about what we can do in Tokyo that's related to technology, please let me know, because I haven't prepared for that part of the trip at all. So if you know anything about Tokyo and technology, computers, anything related to what we do even somewhat, uh, let me know what it is, and hopefully we can go make a video about it. All right, first question. Robert... Depois, Depo, De, I don't know, says, uh, Gamers Nexus, I would really like to get your take on the IC graphite thermal pads that are supposedly capable of replacing thermal paste. Since they're also reusable, they could be great value for the money. Your in-depth testing is about the only channel I trust with results, and I believe your audience would be interested. I agree, and I'm interested too. We're probably going to look at it, be looking at it after Computex for timing reasons. Uh, I mean, the thing is, this is something I've been interested in, it's just we have so much going on. It's really hard to prioritize A versus B when we're working on stuff. So uh, I'll try and look at it. Keep bugging me about it in the comments. Uh, we get back in June, so I'll look at it then. But um, here's the one thing I will say is I, I think the graphite thermal pads are way overhyped. I have done some preliminary looking into them, and I, I think they're really not deserving of the amount of praise they're getting. Like it's, this is not new technology. Uh, this stuff has been around. There's a reason there's not a lot of it on the market. And we've done testing of this stuff before where I've tested some for, uh, I can't really, can't share a lot of it right now, but I've tested 
pads of substances that are not thermal paste uh, in the past. And oftentimes it's, it's sort of billed as a lot more than it is in terms of performance. Like they're cool, they're kind of reusable, there are still downsides to using them. Uh, and ultimately there's a reason why a lot of people use paste. So some of these pad like uh, interfaces that I've tested and I, I don't know when I'm gonna be able to talk about them if ever, uh, but because it was a prototype. But some of the, the pad type interfaces that replace thermal paste for CPU to cool our contact are, uh, are really pretty bad and some of them are okay. But I haven't yet encountered one that's better than comparable thermal paste or liquid metal, depending on what you're doing. One interesting thing is the really thin pads, I, I would be curious to see how they perform between the die and the IHS. I've done some testing on it. Uh, it was never, the problem with it was uh, if you're using a conductive one, that's a bit harder to protect against, if, especially if it, if it uh, has a phase change or something like that, which uh, anyway, uh, hopefully I can share more with you someday. But uh, in the meantime, the IC graphite stuff, yeah, I, I'll try. I, I see, we'll seriously try when we get back. Let's see if we get hit with a wave of GPUs or not, and then I'll know. Uh, I'll know if we have time. But um, to kind of give you some immediate thoughts, though, I do think it's way overhyped. It's an interesting product. It has use cases. It's worth playing around with. But thermal testing is really hard. Like, we revise our thermal testing almost every day. I mean, we, we kind of specialize in it for GPUs especially. You haven't seen a lot of it because there are no new GPUs, but we've specialized it in for a bit and it's hard to do it right. Computer software is really difficult to work with. There are a million variables with a test bench. So even if you control everything to the best of your ability, even every single voltage in BIOS, which you have to do, the software is still hard to control. So basically you need like a current clamp on the EPS 12 volt cables. You need reliable software that reads the power of the CPU because power is what generates heat. So you need to control those two things very specifically and then also go through all the voltages and BIOS and manually set them. No auto allowed ever for that kind of CPU thermal testing. And also use software that you can control to a relative degree of certainty and then run multiple repeat tests uh, instead of throwing out outliers, inspect them and see why are they an outlier. If it deserves to be thrown out, then throw it out. But um, it's, it's pretty hard to do thermal testing accurately. We revise it constantly. I would imagine that a lot of user testing online, and I haven't looked at other media outlets, truthfully. I, I really haven't looked at other uh, media outlet reviews of these pads. But I would be cautious of trusting thermal testing from random sources on the internet because it's hard to do it accurately. And also, even if they do it accurately, it's probably not comparable to person B's test from person A's test. Because there's so many ways to do thermal testing. If it's not controlled, then you might just be looking at two different scenarios where it might perform well in one, not the other. Or you could just have a bunch of useless data. So next question, Guy Vera says, how are graphics card water blocks made? This is a really good question. Are they machined from bar stock or cast and then finished by a mill? I'm not an expert on manufacturing, but I can do some research. So I uh, looked around a bit and talked to some people as well. Uh, EK water blocks, plexi parts, like their terminals, are made out of CNC machined. Uh, they are CNC machined from solid acrylic pieces uh, that are cast. And most blocks are machined, and there's actually a great video from Aqua Computer. We'll, we'll put it up on the screen, hopefully, if the editors catch this. But uh, Aqua Computer shows how the blocks are made, mostly using CNC's and mill attachments and even polishing attachments to basically, the CNC part subtracts out unwanted material to make the channels, and a lot of water blocks use milling and machining. Some of them are cast. They tend to be a bit cheaper, according to our friend VSG from Thermalbench. Uh, if they are cast, but most are machined or, uh, or produced in the fashion you're seeing with Aqua Computer. Some of these companies collect the remaining scrap metals for recycling. Aqua Computer is one of them. So Aqua Computer basically as, as they subtract out the copper they don't want, it gets kind of pushed aside, eventually filtered out, recycled, goes to scrap 
material companies, and they don't make a ton of money from it, but it helps offset costs a bit. Uh, and then there's also a lubrication solvent that's used as the channels are created. So it helps with the heat that's generated from the milling devices. They get really hot uh, just from friction and then and speed. And uh, also helps with cleaning things out, i.e. solvent and lubricant. So that gets filtered actually and can be reused as well. It's pretty recyclable, unlike water, uh, which gets dirty and useless with time. So that's pretty cool as well. Anyway. That's about the most I know. So I do really like the question. Uh, hopefully that gives you the basics of it. And this kind of made me think like, oh, we should just go visit one of these factories sometime and make a video. So we'll probably do that. Next question is from the Gula who says, downdraft coolers are actually worse in all caps at cooling the VRM than tower coolers. They're blowing hot air from the CPU right off on top of the VRM. Some of that hot air circulates back into the downdraft cooler. The tower cooler, on the other hand, blows hot air right out of the PC and sucks some air by negative air pressure from the VRM. Okay, so first of all, this blanket statement is a really pl bad place to go. Saying things like, downdraft coolers are worse at cooling the VRM than tower coolers is uh, for sure going to make you incorrect in at least a few instances. You might be right in some, you'll be wrong in others. Cooling is complicated. The design of the case impacts how it works. The design of the cooler impacts how true this statement is. So we, as someone who has done testing on this properly and in depth, the thing is, and I, I see you mentioned Hardware Unboxed too, I haven't seen their video, but it looks like what you're doing here, I'm not saying anything about their content, I haven't seen it, but what you are doing by uh, commenting on their content, you're saying they have a tower cooler outperforming Wraith and cooling the VRM. Well, they're different coolers. So it's possible, yes, that a tower cooler, especially with a low enough fan, which we've tested, can cool VRM components better in some instances than a downdraft cooler. It's also possible, as we've tested, that a tower cooler with a crappy fan, particularly one that's, that's higher up from the socket, doesn't get any air over the VRM. Both will be better in general than a front-mounted CLC, which is just pulling, it's pushing hot air into the case because you've, well, it's pulling in cold air and then it's going through a radiator. It's pushing hot air into the case. And if you have no other fans in the case, we're assuming a basically closed system, then that would be the worst case. If you have a tower cooler and no other fans in the system, that would be better than what I just described. But a tower cooler versus a downdraft cooler the answer is it depends. So the first two things are more or less concrete for the most part. And tower versus downdraft efficacy is going to depend on what kind of fan is used, where is it positioned, and uh, are there any other fans in the system? Also, where are the mesh ventilation ports if there are any? How small is the box? Is it an ITX box? If it is, then it's possible that uh, in some instances, a downdraft could be better and some could be worse because you don't, it depends on where the ventilation ports are, if there are any again, and, uh, and also just how crammed it is in there. So to say just flat out that downdraft coolers are actually worse at the VRM cooling than tower coolers is incorrect because it's a blanket statement. That's correct sometimes and it's very wrong other times. So for the point of it's blowing hot air from the CPU onto the VRM, okay but it's blowing air onto the VRM. So it's still getting air onto these components, potentially even over a heatsink in most cases, which is going to be better than stagnant airflow, which is what you'll get with some tower coolers that have their fan position too high up or just a really bad low pressure fan. And a lot of those exist, especially some of the Hyper 212s, because not all of them, but Hyper 212s use different fans depending on what production run you get. And some of them suck more than others. So, uh, yeah, I mean, any airflow is better than no airflow. The fact that the air, air has been warmed is really sort of irrelevant because you're talking about an air temperature that's maybe like 40 degrees Celsius. A VRM can get up to like 100 plus, like for a MOSFET. So you're not making it worse. <laughs> that's for damn sure. Next one. Uh, Namach, I don't want to give my real name. Okay, that's easier. It uh, says, dumb question, is it better to plug in the computer than turn on the power supply, or is it better to turn on the power supply and then plug in the computer, or does it not matter? Same question in reverse. 
The only reason I'm including this is because it's actually kind of uh, is, is very simple, but also a good question. And also brings us back to basics a bit. The only reason it would matter is if you, sometimes you get an instant on signal. From, it depends on like the, the last state of the motherboard in the system. Uh, it may have been powered down in a way that it's going to attempt to boot as soon as it detects PS on. Uh, or as soon as it detects standby voltage from a power supply once you flip the switch. So if that's the case, or I've had some power supplies that'll just turn on when you plug them in, uh, even if, you know, with the switch set to on, by the way, uh, even if you don't push any kind of button or trigger anything, a lot of that is just going to depend on the motherboard. So what's the last known state of the motherboard? Is it trying to send a signal to the power supply to turn it on? Um, so I would just recommend uh, plug it in and we are actually plug all your cables in first of all um, and then uh, turn on the power supply last so plug in the cable flip the switch later uh, it doesn't really matter a whole lot but just in case there's like a an on signal coming from the motherboard as soon as you plug everything in and flip the switch just make sure all your cables are plugged into the motherboard but I mean, it really doesn't matter a whole lot. It's just kind of, it, just make sure your stuff's plugged in just in case. Cause like, for example, in a, a nightmare scenario, you could have maybe forgotten PCIe cables, maybe one of them to a video card or something that can actually cause damage in some instances. It depends on the video card, what kind of protection, everything that the motherboard, the video card and the power supply have, but uh, you don't want to cause any damage unnecessarily. So next one is, uh, or is it, oh, hang on, let me reread that. Plug in the computer, turn on the power supply, or turn on the power supply, plug in the computer. Yeah, I go with what I said. Next, it doesn't matter a whole lot though. Next one, TMM. This is a bit of a schadenfreude question, but would you care to elaborate a bit on what were the very worst products that went through the GN gauntlet? The Zalman Z1 was one of the worst. That was a case. Man, that was that was a bad case. It's also not a great video. I mean, like it was it was good content from us, but. The video quality was not good. It was a long time ago. So the Z1 was bad enough. I'm fine sharing this publicly now, given how much distance there is from it. It was bad enough that we, when we met with Zalman the next time at an event, basically the entire time was spent talking about that case. And then later they called me, they talked about like, this is a long time ago. This is before we really sold a lot of ads or anything like that. or really had much income. They called me and they were like, we want to run an ad with you. And I thought, okay, this is, Seems like strange timing, but let, let's talk business. And I gave them a couple numbers. They came back with really bad offerings. And, uh, and then after we kind of had a loose agreement on a potential deal, uh, they were like, okay, um, can you remove one last thing? Can you remove the review? And I said, no, like, no, fuck you. Of course not. That's not how this works. So that ad never happened terminated the agreement, obviously, uh, and we never worked with them again because that's pretty screwed up. So uh, that was our last dealing with Zalman because that, the Z1 was bad, but bribing, way worse. So anyway, the, I don't know what their status is even these days. Their parent company was kind of killed from some kind of scandal. So, And just to be clear, we haven't had that happen since or from any other company. It's the only instance. We actually published an article talking about some of the underhanded things that people in the industry have done. It was all anonymous. This was years ago. I anonymized who did what and just said, this is wrong, don't do it. And we haven't had a problem since. So I think the people in the industry got that message and, uh, and no more shady bullshit to that extent happened uh, since that time. Other bad products, I guess, really bad ones. Uh, I mean, I didn't like the H500P, and I would, it was certainly not, that was more bad marketing though, because the, the base of it was still an okay product, so in terms of like, like the frame, like literally the shell and the two fans, and then they made it into a good, a really good product that we recommend highly with H500P match, so I wouldn't put that in that category, because it was mostly marketing that was bad in that instance. Man, what was a really, truly bad product that we looked at? <clears throat> Oh, uh, another case, the Rosewell Gungnir. That one just came to mind. That was a pretty bad product. 
mostly cases. We've worked with some video cards that had really bad drivers, but the products were eventually okay. Uh, I think most of the stuff that we really hated was for adjacent reasons that were correctable, like, like drivers or uh, changing the mesh on the front of the case or whatever, stuff like that. But really the, the worst one was the Zalman Z1. The Rosewell Gungnir was very bad. And we've had a couple of really oddball products, like some of the low-end Intel CPUs just don't make any sense whatsoever to buy in terms of the value. I, I, I don't know that I'd say they're bad because it's not like they're broken or anything. They're just really bad value. Same for some of the, in, the AMD CPUs, like some of the um, A-series APUs, the original, like the non-Vega APUs, some of those were really bad value also. So, but not bad products necessarily. Anyway, we've, we've reviewed a lot of bad products, but uh, we kind of review them and then I forget about them. So the names of the most of them escape me. Oh, coolers for sure though. There are definitely some really bad coolers out there that we've looked at. Um, that uh, Cooler Master Chief one, the Master Liquid one, leaked when we used it because the screws they provided with it had enough of a, a variance in the length that one of them was just long enough to escape tolerance of hitting the radiator when you screw it in. And most comp actually like all of the companies for the most part with liquid coolers have a little metal shield between the screw and the radiator uh, so that it can't cause a leak. And also, if not that, then they have fins back there instead of a tube. So if you do screw in too far because the tolerance was bad from the factory with the screw, then it, worst case scenario, it, it destroys like a piece of a fin doesn't really matter as opposed to going through a tube. So that was, I would say that was a bad product. And then uh, we also worked with an old, uh, like a Peltier cooler basically, and I can't remember the name of it, but that one was pretty bad too. It was, it was almost $200 and very complicated. It had power going into it and everything and didn't cool any better than like a $40 92 millimeter cooler. So that was another bad product. Can't remember the name of it though. Uh, uh, and we have some more coming up too, but oh, also the scam, the like two terabyte USB key we reviewed, except it was actually like eight gigabytes. It says two terabytes in, actually it might've been less. It says two terabytes in Windows, but it tricks you. Uh, so they spoof it. And then in reality, it's like four or eight gigabytes. And as you write more data, it'll just, it'll either fill up and give an error or it'll start overwriting the previous data. So that was a really bad product as well. Uh, cables, we've worked with some cables that were just straight scams. Like a, now they're coming back to me. Uh, we're going back like years in history now, probably six. There's DVI cable. So uh, there are a lot of DVI cables that will advertise as dual link, i.e. more bandwidth and capable of driving a, a diff, you know, a, a higher resolution or a higher refresh. And they'll advertise dual link. They'll even have the pins for it. But then if you just do a simple continuity check, like with a multimeter, just check end one to end two, uh, pin A to pin A on either side. And in some of those fake dual link DVI cables, it'll come back. I mean, it's, it's not continuous. There's no wire in there. It's just two pins. So those are bad products too. The best way to tell if a dual link DVI cable is real, not that it's relevant anymore, is if it's super fat. Because if it is, then it probably has the extra wires in there for those pins. Uh, but a lot of fakes out there, a lot of scams that we've looked at. I think that's most of it. It's probably, probably most of it right now. We've looked at a lot of bad VR stuff, but um, a lot of bad games. If I think of more, I'll let you know. <laughs> uh, next one. Gamer Games, is water cooling RAM worth it featuring ADATA Spectrix D80 Jellyfish and any programs to stress memory? Not really, no. It's like, it's kind of interesting and the Jellyfish stuff is a good way to get some attention as a memory manufacturer, making a component that for the most part is a commodity at this point uh, where you just pick kind of what's the most affordable. So it's a good way to get attention, totally unnecessary. And DDR4 especially, it's already low voltage, it's low heat. Even we were running 4,000 megahertz tight timings for that RIP LTT stream, and it didn't need a fan on the memory. Now, older versions of DDR you could do with some cooling, but you didn't need that. Next one, Commander Flint. Does enabling the iGPU on Intel CPUs impact CPU overclock thermals? 
uh, or performance in general, some DX12 titles and certainly benchmarks are beginning to make use of explicit multi-GPU and can potentially make use of integrated graphics on Intel CPUs, uh, minimal gain, gains given the relatively feeble nature of it, but gains nonetheless. Surely having another piece of silicon active drawing power and creating heat on the CPU die will have negative impact on the CPU itself. So uh, potentially, if they're using more power jointly, then yes, you're going to end up with more heat. It's all, it all comes down to how much power is being used under that IHS. And whenever you have more power being used, it's going to be hotter for everything under it. Um, that said, in our Premier benchmark, we actually found there was less power consumption by about two. There, in terms of current, it was about two amps less with, or two, two fewer amps uh, running the IGP versus not. And that's because what happens is the IGP is accelerating to a point that the CPU doesn't need to do as much work anymore. So you end up with, with lower power consumption overall to the extent of like 20 watts, 24 watts in that scenario, which means that the CPU will be cooler, the IGP will be warmer, but, uh, but not unreasonably warm. And so between the two of them, you end up actually better off overall. As for games, uh, DX12 titles, I do not think you'll end up ahead by using an, an Intel IGP with explicit multi-GPU if it's even supported. I would have, I'd be hard pressed to find one. Uh, using an IGP with a DGPU, I don't think you're going to end off ahead. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't really tested it. I'm not aware of any titles that are able to do that. But I hope the rest of it answers your question, though. More power is more heat. Uh, Boone says, I know this is getting really picky, but have you considered adding a snap to the left side of the mod map for a common ground point? Given where I want to put one, I really need the ground connection on the left side of the mat. I'm sure I could run an extension to it. Would be so much neater if I didn't have to. Kill management, OCD strikes again. I'm also open to modding my mod mat. <laughs> That's super meta. You need a mod mat to mod the mod mat. Uh, any suggestions on adding a snap on my own mat without having to buy a minimum pack of 100 or more of these things? What are the specs of the snap? We have it on the site. They're 10 millimeter uh, snaps. So on this side, if you wanted to mod your own, I, I don't know where you can buy the snaps individually. I haven't looked. Um, and I don't think you'd really be able to, I've done it. You, you wouldn't really be able to pull this out too cleanly. It'll leave a bit of a mess and damage some of the rubber around it. Uh, I, I mean, I've done it because I, when I was prototyping them, I put my own hole in the mat and like put a snap in it, which I pulled off of another one that I spent like a hundred dollars on. So not the best solution, but, um, yeah, it's a, this is a 10 millimeter male stud and this is a 10 millimeter female snap. So that's the, the parts. Now I haven't looked at where you can buy them. I'm sure you could find it on eBay or something. And then you'd basically just, uh, get something to poke a hole in this side. Obviously, we don't officially recommend modding it, but I totally understand why you would want to. So if you want to do that, you find something, poke a hole in there cleanly, and um, find the, the snap and everything. If you're really concerned about it, send us an email, support at gamersnexus.net, and do me a favor, do a bit of the work for us, because uh, I have a support guy who does that stuff, but for a technical question, I'll have to get in there. So uh, do me a favor, if you do email, specifically send links to the things you're thinking of buying and I'll let you know if it'll be compatible with this common ground point uh, and hopefully make sure everything works cleanly for you. As for adding one, if more of you want like a, a second snap on this side, let me sound off in the comments and we'll look into it. I don't think it would be too big of a deal to do that, to add a second one. And I think that's all for this one. So uh, thank you for watching. As always, go to patreon.com slash gamers next to top it out directly and get the bonus episode. And uh, that'll be it for now. We'll do more when we're in Taipei at Computex. So subscribe for that. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up the mod mat I was just talking about. Oh yeah, quick update. These are in stock, like here, and they're shipping. So it's no longer a back order. If you want one, it'll basically ship you know, within a day of you ordering it. So uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.